This is a true crime podcast. It contains adult themes and content and may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. He said, you know what this is? I said, yeah, it's a razor blade. He said, I got you at my mercy, don't you? And here, they were guards and I was a convict. And that's the way it was. You knew where you were. He said, I wish you would just learn to behave like ladies. And uh, he said, if you draw any blood, I'll kill every man in there. So the man dropped the knife and turned to the other men that were with him that he had set loose out of the very cells and said, well, he means it. He'll kill us if we don't give up. So they gave up. You do your own number. You do your own time. If you hear something, you keep it within yourself. If you see something, you're blind to it. I don't care if it's... If it's uh, a killing or whatever, you just don't see it. Welcome to Behind Gray Walls, a podcast brought to you right out of the old Idaho State Penitentiary. My name is Anthony. I'm joined in the studio here with the brilliant Sky. Oh, accolades. That's <laughs> very lovely of you. Anthony's far more brilliant than I am, but thank you. I'm thank just, you nonetheless. No, <laughs> you're welcome. Today is going to be a heavy one. Um, we have our, our two, probably two of our are, would you say like our two biggest, our two famous, most, most sensationalized, famous? Uh, I'd say, yeah. yeah, the most famous, uh, the most asked about as well. Mm-hmm. I feel like mm-hmm. if people ask, you know, who are the worst inmates that ever served there? Mm-hmm. I think these two are good representatives mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. the male and female population. Yeah. <laughs> We've got uh, Raymond Snowden, mm-hmm. Jack the Ripper of Boise. <laughs> Not really. Not but really. We'll talk about All that right. more. And then today, I will be talking about Lida Southard, who is easily our most infamous and our most famous, like I said. So, um, before I get started, just want to talk about the sources a little bit of where I got this information. Um, most of it comes from Lida's inmate file, newspaper articles, things like that. I also found an ancestry profile that was probably uploaded by her family. Um, and there's a lot of details in there of like, she married this person on this date. And, and like when her brother was born, she was this many years old, things like that. So whoever uploaded that, if you're listening, thank you very much for that. Do your family genealogy. Yes. And it might help us someday. Mm-hmm. Like you would be surprised how many inmates I can find on, yeah. on genealogy and the, the ancestry.com and things like that. So yes, I agree with Anthony 100%. And then... There also is a book that exists. It's called <laughs> Lady Bluebeard, The True Story of Love and Marriage, Death and Flypaper by William C. Anderson. Now, it does say a true story, and theoretically the base event is true. I've been reading through it because I, I wanted to see what sort of extra information was in here. We've been having some entertaining... Oh. Uh, <laughs> recitations in my office this week. (laughs) Oh boy, guys, is all I have to say. You know, it is well written. I will give him that. It is very well written. Here's here's what he says about it at the very beginning. Because it doesn't seem... So he says, this is the preface. So it says, this is a true story. In the interests of clarity and continuity, some dramatic license has been taken with dialogue as well as a few of the peripheral characters. So dramatic. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and then the major characters are all real, the dates are correct, and the incidents happen just as depicted. Now, to say he took some dramatic license is a <laughs> bit of an understatement. Um, this book, I would say, is far more historical fiction than it is any sort of biography. And he said that he especially was in a unique position to write the story because he would ride his bike out to the penitentiary all the time. That doesn't necessarily make you qualified to write a book mm-hmm. about an inmate. And it is very creative. Again, I I have to give him credit where credit is due, but I just don't think it is a biography like he portrays it. Yeah. You're going to read some of these pages of narration. uh, Uh, Yeah. I mean, (laughs) there, and actually there are some, I would say, like R-rated scenes in here. Um, I I read you one the other day and I found another one that was like even worse. Whoa. (laughs) Where... People are in bed together, and it's a little raunchy. It, so yeah. um, I don't even know. Is this still in? It's not in it, print. Not in no, print. Yeah. Okay. So we may have like one of the only copies of it that 
exist still? I, I think you can find it on Amazon or like those, you know, booksellers, mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. rare book finds sort of places. But, mm -hmm. you know, we it took us a while to find this copy. Yeah. I mean, so if you're interested in like a fictionalized account of it, mm -hmm. because there's just a lot of quotes that are like very precise words. Mm -hmm. There are just pages that are literally just like sentence after sentence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like here's just a <laughs> here's just a little quote. It says, "For God's sakes, divulge," said Ormsby. "This woman is wanted for murder." Oh, oh mercy me! <laughs> her hands flutter to her mouth. Murder. <laughs> Did it you can't see? Be. <laughs> it's just like we we for sure know that like this may not have happened like yeah, it just yeah. it's very funny so there is information in here and theoretically all the information is accurate he just really punched up and spiced up um what was going on there's yeah. scenes set in mexico that are perhaps a little racist but it's fine it was it was, it was published in 94 so a product of its time uh, i guess <laughs> maybe i mean 90 uh. seems a little late for that but but it's also referencing like the 20s and 30s, true, right? True so fair, it fair, fair. kind of is trying to make a product mm -hmm. of its time and make an entertaining read out of a female serial killer's mm -hmm. story. Yeah. So let's get to the facts. Yeah. That's what we're here for. Yeah, for sure. But I do want to say that there oh, is yes. a drag queen in oh, this book. Right. It's, uh, <laughs> it's very interesting. That was a very flowery it, scene that you described. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you're interested yeah. in reading about drag queens and, and, um, Mexicans named El Zorro. Please see if you can find a copy of that. Yes. All right. To the facts. <laughs> now, Lida Southard. She was born Lida or Lydia Anna Mae Elizabeth Trueblood on October 16th, 1892 in either Salisbury or Keatsville, Missouri. Um, they're pretty close to one another. I looked it up on a map. They're in um, north central Missouri. Um, her parents were William J. and Laura Trueblood. She was third of 11 children, um, six boys and five girls, and all but three lived into adulthood. Wow. So, and I, as far as I could tell, like they all, even there was one who died in, I think like the fifties. So, you know, he would have been like in his, but that's like kind of the earliest yeah. who lived into adulthood. So wow. that's a lot of kids. That's yeah. what, eight? eight kids to live into adulthood, which for the 1920s is actually mm -hmm. a pretty, pretty good percentage. That's uh, Ray's family. He's the sixth of eight. We'll get to that. They mm. both come from big oh, families. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe there is something to that. I mean, of course, there are uh, <laughs> families. I know many. I have large, I have a large family myself, and I, yes. none of them are serial killers as far as I know. If Same, you're in yeah. my family and you are a serial killer, please tell me. I... I don't care. I just probably want to know. Um, okay. So she grew up mostly in Missouri. They moved to Idaho around 1900. So she would have been about eight. And she, so she was the third of 11, like I said, and her youngest sister was born in 1914. So she would have been, oh gosh, I can't do math, like 22 years older than, Whoa. than her youngest sister, which yeah. is quite a gap. She would have been a parent. Like yeah. Figure. Well, yeah. she was married, I think, before, wow. and her daughter was. We'll get into all this, but I think her mm -hmm. daughter was born before her youngest sister was, she which actually is. I've had similar things in my family. So, mm -hmm. not judging. <laughs> so, moved to to uh, Idaho around 1900. They moved to Ferdinand, which is up north, and then they moved to Twin Falls in about 1906, according to our favorite book. So, hopefully, that's a little bit accurate. So at age 19, which is around 1912, she marries a man named Robert C. Dooley, who is a farmer from Missouri. Um, he's actually from the same place that she's from. She's from Keatsville. Keatsville so right. I'm wondering if maybe they met in Keatsville, like when they were really young. And then I don't know if he followed her or if they both just happened to end up in Twin Falls. I like yeah. wish I knew the story behind that, yeah. but uh, we don't have any of that information, unfortunately. It'd be a good icebreaker. Like, hey, yeah. I'm, I'm from Keatsville. Right, yeah. Keatsville, Missouri. Yeah. Keats, yeah. Keatsville, Missouri. Yeah. I imagine that's how it's probably not true. <laughs> no, probably. Anyway, so 1912 marries Robert C. Dooley. In 1913, she they have a daughter. Her name is Lorraine. She's born on October 9th, 1913. Um, they live in Twin Falls. Things are good until 1915. And 
Lyda has a, a hard thing happen, and both Robert and Lorraine die, um, supposedly from typhoid. Whoa. Um, I I've read both accounts either like that both of them died first, if that makes sense. So I've heard I read one part that Robert died first, and another mm. that Lorraine died first. So either way, clear. yeah, they they only died within months of each okay. other. Right. So yeah. either way, it's that's tough. Like just super tough and then to make things even more sad a few months before robert dies her brother-in-law actually passed away wow. um so she had three deaths basically within like six months of each other and that cannot be easy so um she takes a little while to grieve about a year and a half and then in june 1917 she marries william c mcafee in twin falls and then they move to montana at some point in october 1918 again she gets a really tough break mcafee dies um, from influenza and diphtheria in hardin montana which is not too far from billings and is actually right on the edge of the north cheyenne and crow indian reservations so kind of near that area so then again heartbroken but probably just needs to pick herself up and move on in march 1919 she marries harlan c lewis in denver colorado i think they met in montana because then they go back to montana okay where in july 1919 so four months later harlan dies of complications of gastroenteritis oh. in billings so she is just really just, just having a rough time all around yes. her wow yes okay so she waits about a year in august 1920 she marries a man named john edward meyer in bannock county so at some point she moves from montana after the death of her third husband moves back to bannock county it's more than likely pocatello because that's mm -hmm. usually the biggest yeah. city in bannock county and there's a magazine article that was written in like the 19 30s 19 late 1920s right after, after her trial and the magazine calls him fred meyer which oh, i love because i was at fred meyer last night getting groceries yeah. so i always think that's very funny but i'm pretty sure his name is john edward and they just got his name wrong oh, altogether yeah, so that happens so often we're yeah, going to talk about yep. that a lot mm -hmm, on the show mm -hmm. So um, she married John Edward Meyer in August 1920, so just about a year after Lewis died. And then September of 1920, so like the next month, he dies. Wow. And um, he died in Twin. So within that month, they moved to Twin after getting married in Bannock County, and he dies. And she doesn't really wait too much time. About two months later, in November 1920, she marries a man named Paul Vincent Southard. Um, she actually marries him under an alias, Edith Eva Meyer, which wow, okay. should be maybe a clue as to what's maybe going on. Yeah. And they leave for, Paul was in the Navy, and so they leave and they go to Honolulu, Hawaii. Wow. So... That's five husbands in eight years. Eight years. That's, and each one just mm -hmm. dies a little bit mm -hmm. earlier than the yes. last. Yes, yeah. Um, and oh. she starts to get married even quicker. Wow. You know, she waits like a year and a half, and then she waits eight months, and then six, and then two. Oh. Like, so understandably, after Meyer's death, um, there's a Twin Falls deputy sheriff. His name is Val Ormsby, and he starts to get really suspicious because he knew Lida growing up, and he knew that she uh, had had all this tragedy and she was only 27, I think, at the time. Wow. Um, and so he's thinking like, hmm, that's very strange. Yeah, um, not maybe, only, maybe a red flag's popping not up. Not only did her husbands die, but her daughter died and her brother-in-law died. So so things are getting a little suspicious and it, it right. seems improbable that she would have such bad luck with husbands. <laughs> So it comes to light that between the deaths of her four husbands, Southard had collected nearly $10,000 in life insurance, which in 2019 wow. money is about $141,000. Oh my gosh, that is... She even collected $2,500 on her brother-in-law. Wow. Which I think, because I think the way that worked is he made it out to his brother, to Robert. And so then when Robert oh. died, she got the money. And and did the brother-in-law die first or did... The brother-in-law died first. Okay. And then and then Robert did. Wow. I wonder if Robert ever had any inkling. Like... Yeah. I I don't... And that's the thing is I don't I know if... I never know that, Yeah. But, I, I don't yeah. know if Lida convinced the brother-in-law to do it or if it was just... I, I, I'm not I, sure. Yeah. 
I I wish that we had all this information. I wish more than anything that we had Lida's diaries where oh, she like wrote about all of this. Yeah. So if anyone knows of Lida Souther's diary somewhere, please let us know because that would be amazing. That would be a treasure trove. Oh, I would go crazy for that. So again, collects $10,000. Interestingly, there were two husbands that she didn't collect on. The first is McAfee and he actually only had about $500 okay. on his life insurance policy. It wasn't a ton. She also did not collect on Meyer, her last husband to die. Um, it's speculated that she didn't collect on Meyer because the insurance company wouldn't pay until the autopsy was done and she knew something was up. And so she skipped town before like the autopsy was finished. So she just didn't collect the money. Whoa. That and, would cause some red flags. And and the prosecution yeah. actually like brings this up during the trial. Yeah. So Ormsby and then a county prosecutor named Frank L. Steffen, I'm assuming, um, they lead the investigation of these deaths because it's obviously crazy suspicious. And they go to Montana and because um, they're kind of investigating these two deaths that happened in Montana. Mm-hmm. And in one of the homes, the homes that she had with McAfee, she left a bunch of stuff. She left pots and pans and kitchen utensils and left all this stuff. And the people who took the house after her kind of actually started to use it themselves. They're like, oh, she left it. So we'll, you know, we'll use it. And in some of the pots, they found white rings around the rim, kind of the the Uh. rim of the the pot. And so they actually test this. And um, while things are being tested, they're still investigating. And they go down to the basement of this house. The owners let them in and, and they see the basement and they find a stack of fly paper about a foot high. Wow. Which is a lot. And and yeah. even the the people out in Montana, they say like, yeah, I mean, it's Montana. We get flies all the time. So it's not unusual to have fly paper, but it is unusual to have fly paper in that amount. Yeah. Like it's a lot. This is like industrial quantity. Yes. There's like, no reason for any sort of housewife in right. Billings, Montana to oh, have this much gosh. fly paper. And, and the, so, the ring, that, that yes. white ring tested positive for the well, arsenic? Well, so... So that's they're still investigating okay, this. Okay. And so they they see the flypaper and Ormsby starting to go like wait a minute there's arsenic yeah. in in this flypaper. And so sure enough they get that that testing back there is arsenic in those white oh rings on the pot. God. So he starts to kind of think through like what might be happening. And so they conclude that what she did is she took the flypaper, she boiled it so that all the arsenic came off of it and then basically skimmed the arsenic out yeah. and like sprinkled it on her husband's food. Oh my um, gosh. So with this, they decide to do an autopsy, which is understandable, or they exhume the bodies and, and do autopsies. So I think they exhume at least three of her husbands, all wow. the ones in Idaho at least, because the ones that are in Montana, they can't really touch as, as official Idaho investigators. Yeah. So... They actually, they also exhume her daughter. They find traces of arsenic in all the husbands. And in Meyer, there was actually enough arsenic to kill five men. Five men. Five men. Wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So there's so much arsenic. And in, how, how long were they married again? They was were that, married oh, for a, a like month. A month? Yeah. So she was... Married in September. Oh, uh, sorry. Married in August. He died in September. So she kind of had this down. Mm-hmm. She knew what she yes, was doing Yes, I mean, this, this is her fourth. Yeah. husband that she kills and she knows she's getting away with it but she gets a little hasty i think is the problem yep. so they do an autopsy on her daughter as well there isn't any arsenic found in her daughter's system so they're thinking maybe it is possible that she did die of typhoid or something else because the 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 defense actually tried to argue that there was arsenic in these men's systems because there was basically arsenic in the groundwater and oh. it would like see it seep down into the bodies but but because there wasn't any arsenic in the little girl, they yeah. they couldn't use that argument right, anymore. That so that whole yeah, argument. so it actually kind of worked out for the prosecution wow. that there was an arsenic in this little girl system, which I really hope she didn't kill her own daughter. Um, right. But who is to say, really? So obviously they find arsenic in Meyer. They have enough to try her for Meyer's death because that's wow. really the one they have the most evidence on. Mm-hmm. Because I think the most arsenic was found in him. So they end up searching for her because they don't know where she is. They know she get, went to California and she got married. There's a whole scene of it in our favorite book. And they find out that the man she married is in the Navy. They're in Hawaii. So they actually extradite her from Hawaii. And this, her trial is like trial of the century yeah, in Idaho. Yeah. This is essentially the OJ trial in Idaho in the uh, 1920s. So it's 1921. The trial, again, is just huge. And 
Paul, her husband at the time, he stands by his wife. He cannot believe she's being accused of this. He says like, this is not the woman I married. Yeah. The woman I married would never do anything like this. She loves me and you know, all the things that husbands would say. And this leads her to comment during the trial. Um, she says, quote, don't you think I have a dear husband to stick by me like this? Oh man. I, I wonder I, if yeah, I hate checked like the garage when he got home from, from the trial. Yeah, like look like, for fly trap, <laughs> right, fly paper just, right? well, just in case. I think he was in the process of getting out yeah. a life insurance policy, which if you're oh, in the process of that and you're hearing all this evidence come out, how are you not like Oh, let's uh, stop right there yep. with this. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. So wow. he ends up sticking by her, I think, through the whole trial. So there were 150 witnesses called for the prosecution alone. And then wow. the entire trial took over a month. So huge expense, huge trial, lots of people involved. The jury took 23 hours to come oh to a verdict. And you just had jury duty. Yes. And you, how long did you deliberate it for? It was four hours. And that, it was hard. It's it's exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. So basically six times that amount. Yeah. You're sitting, deliberating. Oh, my gosh. And, and do you know how many people like stood in her defense? Were there quite a few? Oh, of those that's a good question. I wasn't able to get her hands on her trial transcripts. Gotcha. So I'm not sure. I know that. I'm pretty sure Paul Southard. So her husband did. Mm -hmm. um, I think there may have been some people around town who yeah. may have kind of vouched for her. Because, again, she grew up in Twin Falls. Yeah. People would have known her growing up. I don't know how much of her family um, would have been in her defense because there just isn't a lot on her family right, yeah unfortunately i wish there was yeah we need to get a hold of those yes those transcripts. I, it's like 300 pages long yeah. is She's what aaron told so, me oh my god so it's huge wow three yeah 300 pages yeah. how long was snowden's trial transcripts uh, it's i mean maybe 150 yeah so that's including the appeals and everything else. right yeah yeah, so that gives you an idea of the massive scale of yeah, this trial. Wow. It's huge. So after 23 hours, the jury comes to a verdict, all, all male jury, mm. by the way. No one is surprised oh, by this, but all male jury. Yeah. They find her guilty of murder in the second degree. She was originally charged with murder in the first degree. Um, but you mentioned this, um, and I think it is due to the fact that she's a woman. And women are not considered capable right. of these sort of like heinous plotted out crimes mm -hmm. they think it's not possible so i think that you had a good point when we were talking about this earlier that it probably had so much to do with the fact that she was a woman and not necessarily because they didn't have evidence i think it's pretty clear that right, yeah. if you're starting to, if you kill four husbands for insurance money that's not a you know a murder in the mm -hmm. second degree that's clearly murder in the first yeah. degree but we never had a woman in our in our history charged with murder in the first degree always murder in the second degree right, so yeah. obviously things have changed a little bit in that we currently have a woman on death row who was in for murder in the first degree and that is brutal so yes they find her guilty of murder in the second degree she is sentenced 10 years to life she enters the penitentiary on november 9th 1921 so while she's here in prison, she's very well behaved. She actually earns the privilege of taking care of flowers and landscaping in the women's ward. And now I found this out just today, actually. I was researching another inmate who was in here while she was in here. She and a lot of the, the women like to go by nicknames. Oh. And they tended to be more masculine nicknames, and I don't know why. Okay. So Lida was known as Stevie. Stevie. Which oh. is really weird and interesting. So all the inmates and the matron called her Stevie. So for those of you who visited the prison before, you know that the women's ward is separate from the main prison. So obviously the men and women are isolated from each other, but every once in a while, men get to come in um, as, and help out the warden or do some of the, the harder chores or whatever, mm -hmm. kind of around the yard. Lida comes up with this idea. As she's taking care of the, the flowers and the landscaping, she says, you know what, what would really make this area pretty is if we got a lattice and we like had the flowers grow around it. Like oh, imagine yeah. how pretty that would be. And because Lida has been so well behaved, she hasn't had any trouble. She gets along really well with all the girls. She does what she's told. The, the warden and the matron think, yeah, this is a good idea. Yeah. Let's do it. So... They get the trustees to build her a lattice. And the man who... And what's a trustee? A trustee, that's a good question. <laughs> um, a trustee is um, an inmate who 
basically does what he's told. He's behaved really well. He gets special privileges. Yeah. He's trusted. That's kind of, that's the way that I describe that. So he doesn't have to, to live in the prison with everyone else. He gets to live separately outside the walls. He gets a lot of extra privileges. As a trustee, you get to go into the women's mm -hmm. ward and help the warden and things like that. A lot of times you don't even have to be at the prison. You can be on the, the uh, Eagle Island Honor Farm and things mm -hmm. like that. So you're not necessarily treated as a prisoner if you're a trustee. The trustee who comes in with the warden to give light of the lattice, his name is David C. Minton. Mm. And she starts to kind of make friends with Minton. And so he gets her the ladder. He also somehow gets her some saws. I don't know if she used the excuse of like, I need to fix this lattice. Something is uneven with it. If she had some other excuse for it, yeah. but he brings her saws. It could have just been snuck in like yeah yeah exactly like while yeah. he's coming in and helping take out trash and yeah. whatever um so he gets her a saw and they start to hatch this plan together they sneak notes kind of over the wall with each other everything like that oh. so with this um minton gets released uh in early 1931 so on may 4th 1931 about 10 years into her sentence um lida puts this plan into action um that she's been planning with minton so in the middle of the night, she saws through the bars on the window in her cell. And for those of you who are wondering, like, how did no one hear this? It's because the women's ward is so isolated and so separate. There's two different doors. So they would they would lock them in their cells, lock the front door of the building, and then lock the door out from the yard. So you've got three different locks yeah. um, that you would have to break through in order to get out. Yeah, there's no guard area. Mm -hmm. And there's no, like, they don't mm -hmm. have 24 guard. Right. 24-hour guard. And so the matron is usually the warden's wife. So they're just asleep sleep assuming nothing's gonna happen so she saws through the bars on her window in the cell and using the blankets that she was issued and that her cellmate was issued um and so basically what i've heard like the the cellmate was later questioned and lida said like hey give me your blanket and the the cellmate was just like okay she didn't know anything about it she just gave her the blanket and let, let lida do whatever lida do was gonna do to your own number exactly yeah. exactly so um she uses the blankets and she uses the lattice that was supposed to be for the flowers climbs up to the top of the wall and she must have tied the blanket to like a hook sometimes there's hooks kind of on the top of the wall and stuff ties the blanket to the top of the wall shimmies down to the bottom and who is waiting there for her but our very own david c minton oh <laughs> so an alarm isn't raised until the next morning because again right. they don't hear anything um none of the other girls except for her cellmate know that she's even gone and so um i was actually researching an inmate today her name is viola Lowe, and she there's a newspaper article about this alarm that's raised and there's total like everyone hears this alarm and everyone's locked in their cells so they're all kind of yelling at each other hey what's going on and viola says that she lida was in the cell next to her so she yells out stevie press the buzzer for mrs thomas and find out what's happened oh. so she yells to lida trying to be like hey what's going on <laughs> Obviously, light is uh, not there. There's Stevie. no answer. Yeah, there's no answer. And that's when the matron, Mrs. Thomas, comes in and says, like, so light is gone. Oh, and because they didn't notice until morning, Minton and Lida have plenty of time to escape. Oh. They get in a car. They take off. And people are looking everywhere for her. As, yeah. as I said, in our book, they talk a lot about Mexico. But there are tips even from Canada who yeah. are saying we have Lida Southard here. None of these tips ever pan out. Yeah, it's a lot. We'll talk mm -hmm. a lot about a lot of this where it's, you know, eyewitnesses mm -hmm. all across the country mm -hmm. for these individuals. And well, and I would say that even happens like today. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, especially because there was a monetary reward mm -hmm. out for Lida and we're getting into Depression era. Yeah. And so anyone's going to do anything for that money. And exactly. I can't say I blame them. Yeah. You know, like if you can turn in someone and say they're Lida and you get the money for it, like, oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah. because there's all this chaos, they can't find them. They, uh, Lida and, and Minton have plenty of time. They escape to Fort Collins, Colorado. Now, Lida had promised to marry Minton if he helped her get out. But she wasn't real into it, obviously. <sighs> she's very charming. She's clearly very manipulative. Um, she can kind of make men, it seems, do whatever she wants them Absolutely. to do. Yeah. And I can remember Lida Southard. And she had a, a bird in her cell. Sylvia, she called it. And mother encouraged her to have a pet. Uh, Lida embroidered some little curtains for me, I can remember, in my room. She had a kind of a hypnotic power. 
there were a great many wild cats around the penitentiary, and most people couldn't get near them. But she would stand in the doorway of the cell house and say, Kitty, 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 and those cats would go to her. So I don't know what her power was, but it was something that was hypnotic to handle those animals. That's curious, because she was married quite a bit often. Too. Yes, she was. <laughs> so she must have found some power over her. Yes. Um, he's expecting to marry her. She gets to Fort Collins and she says, uh, no thanks. So she... <laughs> like leaves just in the middle of the night leaves she makes her way down to denver and um she starts to work as a housekeeper for a man named harry whitlock this book um our favorite book claims that she went by the name fern zellers when she married him but as far as i can tell he seemed to know her as lida yeah. um her they have a sort of spoiler alerts, but their divorce records name her as actually Lydia, but that means oh, that her name would have been similar yeah. to that when they got married, I would imagine. So they end up getting married. They marry on March 12th, 1932. So it's been 12 years since her, or 11 years since she first was in. So Harry had a sick mother who ends up dying after Lida comes in the house. People understandably try to accuse her of this. Uh, I think even Harry said that like she got really sick after Lida came in. Uh-huh. Didn't didn't you say that you found something where he said that he was like throwing up a lot, yeah. like that he got sick after eating breakfast and things like that. Uh-huh. But she she's questioned about this death and she says I had nothing to do with it. The mother was really sick. Yeah, she died. It wasn't me. Like she just died of natural <laughs> causes. So there's that. But then Harry also had a young son, and Lida liked him a lot. And um, we don't know what his name was. And so here's some quotes about her her new family. Aww. So this is what she says of her husband. She says, at times, I was happy with Mr. Whitlock. He has a pleasing personality and was very good to me, which is not a, a sign of, of true love. Yeah. Um, yeah. That is something that I could say about you as my coworker. Like, <laughs> right. you have a very nice personality. You're very nice to me. Um, hopefully no one is ever saying that about their husband. Right. Um, I, I would hope Becky says things like, I love you. Yeah. And also that you have a pleasing personality and you're yeah, very good to me. Like, I don't that's, know. That should just be implied. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> So obviously, I think we get through that statement, we get this idea that she didn't really love him. Yeah. But here's what she said about her stepson. She said, he has, he being Harry, Harry has a wonderful little boy. He loved me, called me mother, put his arms around me and loved me. And I love him. Uh, So I think she really did care for this little stepson, which is really nice. I don't think she cared too much for Whitlock, but at least she cared for his little boy. So what happens is... A few, about a, so uh, I'd say about six months later, Minton figures out that she's in Denver. Now, again, this book claims that Minton actually knew the whole time where she was, but I don't think that's true. Um, Because I think if she did go under a different name, then it would have been a lot harder to find her. So anyway, he finds out where she is. And so he demands that she return to him. Or, and if he, if she doesn't, then he's he's, he's going to rat her out and he'll right. keep the money. But he says, if you like come with me, I'll turn you in and we'll use that money for your defense fund. But he says, but if you don't, I'll keep the money. Wow, how um, romantic. I know, <laughs> just true love at its finest, yes. this, this relationship. So Lida then decides she she finds out her mother is really sick in Kansas. So she says to Min, uh, to uh, Whitlock, she says, I'm going to go visit my mother in Kansas. Um, I'm going to go be with her until, you know, she possibly dies or until she gets better. Um, and then I'll come back. So she visits her, her mother in Kansas and what she does, and this is actually really, uh, really interesting. Um, she writes him a letter with her name on the envelope uh-huh. at the exact address in Kansas and sends it to Harry, oh. knowing that it's going to be traced back to her. Right. Um, um, and so that was kind of her way of sort of outsmarting uh, Minton, yeah. but at the same time allowing Harry to get that reward oh, money, which I don't, I can't tell if that means that she actually cared for Harry or if she just sort of wanted to like spit in David Minton's face and be I like, you like, don't get anything yeah. from me. Like if I'm, if anyone's going to get this money, it's going to be this man that I'm married to. Yeah. Now, as I mentioned, Harry does divorce her, which is understandable. He does get the reward money. He also is very shocked to find out that his wife is, is wanted for, you know, second degree murder or it was in prison for it and, and is now escaped. The book says the book claims that he really didn't like her after this. Like he was really, really mad at her about it. 
I think that's that's a big character trait that mm-hmm. you should know before you start a relationship. <laughs> is your, you know, significant other a, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. a serial murderer? But or... that also does say more about her and yeah. her charming personality and right. her manipulativeness that oh you can make. Gosh. And especially in the 1920s and 1930s where you don't have the same checks. Like she's not going to get on Facebook. He's right. not going to be able to get on Facebook, check her texts, whatever. Yeah. you got to go yeah, off somebody's you have word to, yeah. in most in every situation. And, and that's, yeah. I mean, we find that in a lot of inmates who they get to go to these new places and just be under an alias. A new uh-huh. alias, no one knows who they are, no one knows what they've done. Yeah. That seems convenient sometimes. Um, we don't have that luxury, uh, I would say, in 2019, which I think is good, Yeah, but also sometimes yeah. bad because every once in a while, you know, it'd be fun to just you know go off to to denver and be a new name and no one knows who you are and so whitlock gets the money there is a rumor and again the book says that this is true but i didn't find any records um but there is the rumor that she he was in the process of or she was trying to talk him into getting uh, a life insurance policy he wasn't in the process of getting one but she was trying to talk him into it like i said i haven't found any evidence that that's true but Mm -hmm. still possible so Again, in the book, Whitlock supposedly claimed that she had a vial of poison on her basically at like all times and he saw it Whoa. and he like questioned her about it because she always would put it in her purse when she left, which I don't know why oh she would put it in her purse, but supposedly she would put it in the purse when she left the house and he one time was like, what is that for? And yeah. she was just like, I just have it. Like that story to me doesn't make any sense because that if seems, that was your plan... Yeah. One, she's not going to enact it yet because she doesn't have a life insurance policy. But two, like, why flaunt it? I was thinking it was for herself. Like, they're not going to mm. capture me. I will drink this poison sure. myself. That, sure. that's Yeah, yeah. No, that would make sense. But at the same time, that seems so drastic for Lyda. Like, it does. Like, Lyda yeah. is not a drastic. Yeah. She, obviously, she goes to drastic lengths to kill her husband's. But in terms of, like, herself, she seems a little too confident in herself yeah. to just commit suicide like yeah, that definitely. so again i that's in the book so that may be a fictionalized part of her story i that doesn't make sense about, yeah though. right wow. right so, i that's also a red flag if mm-hmm. if somebody has a vial yes. of poison yes. on them if they're if they're taking poison with them <laughs> and you see it <laughs> You should maybe be asking some questions, yes. not just of your significant other, but maybe of the police. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Just, I'm single. What do I know? <laughs> um, so, okay. So she gets goes back to prison. And interestingly, she doesn't seem to get any extra time for this escape. She's gone for a full year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it wasn't a on long the books. Time. Escape wasn't on the books. Yeah, she's for... not. Because a lot of these, uh, some of these women who escape, they get time added and so i don't know if it was just like well she's technically here for life anyway so what extra time can we add pretty much it had to have been that so um she doesn't get any extra time for that escape she's kept in prison for about another 10 years her youngest sister so the one that's about 22 years younger than her Uh she actually writes the word in a letter and she pleads on Lida's behalf. She says, listen, my sister is really old. She clearly doesn't pose a threat to anyone anymore. You know, she's getting up there in years. I think at this point she's going to be in her late 40s. And so the parole board apparently kind of agrees with them, especially because Lida's well behaved. She has been since that escape. It's been 10 years. Uh-huh. She's behaved really well. You know, Stevie's got to get out of prison one of these days. Oh. So they parole Lida on October 3rd, 1941, on the condition that she lived with her sister until her, her parole was up. And then the other rule she had to follow was that she would not, quote, exploit experiences by publishing or appearances, unquote, for six months. So she can't sell their story wow. for six, I, after six months. And I guess she can do whatever she wants with mm-hmm. it. But for six months, you can't make appearances. You can't yeah. try to sell your story or anything like that. Because it is sensational and yeah. everyone knows it. And it's probably shocking to the public mm-hmm. that she's being released at all. Yes. Like, wow. Yeah. I, I mean, and I wonder if Hollywood would have been interested in this. I'm, yeah, I'm For absolutely. those of you who don't know, I'm a big old Hollywood fan. Like this Huge would have been. <laughs> it's fine. Um, <laughs> would they have been interested in the story? And we know that the magazine article was published. So we know that people are, are interested in hearing this story, you know, after she's been released. But she can't sell anything can't make money off of that so she served 19 years 10 months and 23 days for likely killing four husbands a daughter and a brother-in-law and escaping for a year wow that's it 19 years wow. she's granted a full pardon in 1943 when she's 51 years old now you may think this is the end of the story oh it is not. it's never the it's end. not so 
after she's released and after her six months, she lives with her sister, doesn't sell her story. She moves down south to Utah. And while she's in Utah, she meets apparently a quite good looking older man. His name is <laughs> Hal Shaw and he becomes her seventh husband. Wow. And does he know going into it who she is and what she's done? You know, I'm not sure if he knows. Um, what we do know is that she I mean, she must still use her name because yeah. his family finds out who she is uh-huh. and they protest. They say like, we don't want that lady cooking for our dad. We don't even want that lady <laughs> married to our dad. And I think, I can't remember if it's in this book or if it's in um, some of the articles that I've been reading, but that she starts to, they kind of travel around and she starts to visit some of her brothers and sisters. And she said that she visited one of her sisters, I think in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And she said like his family found out about me and they don't really want me to be with him. And, but there is like evidence that they were together. Everyone's seen them together. It it seems to be an okay marriage. Yeah. Other than the fact that his children, because he's grown, I think he has two children. And so, his children protest, but they stay married. However, he mysteriously disappears. But here's the thing that I can't figure out. There is no year as to what year he disappears. There is no like evidence of divorce. There's no body. There's no gravestone. On Ancestry.com, it says deceased, but again, yeah. there's no year. Um, there's not. There's one source, and it's actually, I think, his marriage record to Lida. Wow. connected to him on ancestry.com there is nothing yeah i've dug and it's it nothing just, to be found what? with him he's yeah. just gone he's just gone and how long does, is she around after he disappears again we don't know what year he disappears that's the thing right oh. so um and i don't know why i didn't write down the year that they got married because i don't think there is one oh now that i'm thinking about it no it's, it marriage. might not be the record that i found there was something about their marriage but I don't think it was the record. So I don't even wow. know what year they got married. Wow. Okay. So, I mean, it had to have been because she dies in 58. So mm. I would guess late 40s, early 50s. Yeah. I want to say 51. I don't know that, why. That's what I was thinking. Was but like I want to say it's 50s. around 51. Yeah. But there's no year as to when he goes. Like, did he disappear in 51 right when they got married? Did he disappear a couple of years yeah. later? No evidence of divorce. Just <sighs> gone. And so she's around for seven years after they get married. But when did he disappear? We don't know. Yeah. If she killed him, she's gotten a lot better at hiding the bodies. She yeah. also must have done it in a different way. Yeah. She's not collecting insurance money. Because oh. if she wanted to collect insurance money, she would have, one, taken out a policy. And two, would have been like, he's dead. Yeah. You know what I mean? So did he run off after he found out possibly did he go back to his family? Probably not, because yeah. I would imagine his family would have said, you know, after everything's calmed down, they would have said, we have his body. This is when he died. Right. You'd have some evidence. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Just There's... that's the craziest thing. And there, there is no investigation into his death, as far as I can tell. They're it, just, yeah. it. it's crazy to me how thoroughly this man disappears. Wow. Just nothing. She does, so she dies in Utah in 1958 from a heart attack. She actually is walking home from the grocery store and just collapse oh, in the middle of the road. Gosh. So on this death certificate in Salt Lake, it does list him as her husband. Now, if he's gone by this point, it had the coroner or whoever found her had to have known she was married mm-hmm. to a man named Hal Shaw. Yeah. Because they're normally it's that those things are filled out by family members Mm -hmm. who then are able to say this is who they were married to i don't know so i I just that's the thing this whole disappearance like it it's like another chapter that has not been written about her life that has been so traumatic yeah it's so crazy Uh. so after she dies in 1958 she is buried in twin falls she's buried under the name anna e shaw so she keeps his last name, keeps his which I oh hate. I hate that. Yeah. It's not fair. Yeah. Again, in this book, they say that they did it to kind of hide her um, so that people don't know that that's who she is. Yeah. Which, if that's the case, then okay. But Who made the choice? Was right. It... I think it was her sister. It's one oh, of her sisters. Um, okay. Because her parents, are, I think, are both sense. dead yeah. by then. And she's third of 11 or third of eight. So she would have had plenty of younger siblings who wow. were, and she was only, 
66. She wasn't that old, which hopefully I did that math right. I'm I'm a historian. I don't do math very well. <laughs> we have we talk about that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Just people are like, what? How many years between these two dates? Yeah. And you're like, I don't know. Can you? I literally when we had fourth graders come in the other day, I was like, from this year to this year, how many years? And they were like, I don't know. And I was like, okay, well, and I'm not doing yeah. the math. Yeah. I was hoping you guys would tell me. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So that is Lida's big story. Now, during her time, she the press dubbed her Lady Bluebeard, um, just as they gave uh, Raymond the nickname. She wasn't known of known as that in her time. Um, we still use Kinda that today. Yeah. yeah. So this is a nickname that I don't know about you guys, but I don't know what it means. Idaho's Jack the Ripper. Everyone knows Jack the Ripper. Mm -hmm. Bluebeard is a term that I think is was used a lot more in the 1920s and 30s than it is today. So I looked it up. For those of you who know already, my apologies, but for those of you who don't know, bear with me. So um, this is according to Wikipedia, because don't start your research here, but it's good. it's like a French folktale, so it's fine. So Bluebeard, again, is a French folktale, the most famous, sur famous surviving version of which was written by Charles Perrault. The tale tells the story of a wealthy, violent man in the habit of murdering his wives and the attempt of one wife to avoid the fate of her predecessors. The notoriety of the tale is such that Merriam-Webster Dictionary gives the word bluebeard the definition of a man who marries and kills one wife after another, and the verb bluebearding has even appeared as a way to describe the crime of either killing a series of women or seducing and abandoning <sighs> a series of women. Bluebearding. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So do you mind if I just like really quickly talk about the folktale no because it's really it. interesting yeah so bluebeard i won't read it word for word um so bluebeard is a wealthy and powerful yet frighteningly ugly nobleman oh. which i love that <laughs> descriptor so much like <laughs> frighteningly ugly the picture that's on wikipedia is he's like got this big red beard and it's all curly it's like halfway up his face like oh, all you can see yeah. it is his eyes mm. just a little you know understandably suspect so basically <laughs> the story is that bluebeard is this nobleman he's got this big castle he's got lots of money and he starts to marry people and these or marry women and these women start to disappear and everyone in the village knows about it so he um, has this neighbor who's got lots of these young daughters and he has a dinner with them to basically choose one of these sisters as his bride and obviously none of them want to do it because they all know these women go go missing yeah. he ends up choosing the youngest prettiest one to be his wife and she has no choice she has to marry him because you know that's the way women had it back then yeah. he takes her into this large castle and he treats her really well but one day he announces that he is leaving for the country and he gives the keys to his wife and he tells her you can go anywhere you want in the castle except the basement do not go in the basement and if you do i will know so she because her husband's out of town as many women do she has a girls night she invites all her sisters and some of her cousins over and they're just having a good time laughing and doing what they did back then i don't know um <laughs> frolic yeah I, I don't know <laughs> just they're not watching movies like i do but they're doing something <laughs> so she during this this girl's night though she cannot help herself she really wants to figure out what's in this basement because you oh. can't tell someone not to do something and expect them to not do it right that's like telling someone like don't do this but actually i mean do it like yeah. everyone's gonna yeah. do it so she heads down to the basement and she uses the key to open the door she walks in the room and there's blood all over the floor she Ugh. looks up bodies of his wives are hung on hooks oh in this gosh. room she understandably like n no this no. isn't a children's story is it i don't think so oh i hope not gosh. but i mean grim grim's brothers <laughs> right those yeah, that those stuff is gnarly too. yeah so she is freaked out understandably Whoa. she drops the key and runs out of the room and then she realizes she forgot the key. So she goes oh. in and she tries to clean off the key because it is covered in blood. She dropped it in the blood. Oh, but the no. key is magic and the blood doesn't come off. And so she knows that Bluebeard is going to catch her. And so she she doesn't know what to do. So she finally pulls aside one of her sisters and says, listen, like, here's the thing. He told me not to go in this basement. It is full of his murdered wives. Oh. I, what are we going to do? He's going to know that I went in because the, the blood isn't coming off the key. And so the sister says, okay, that's fine let's just leave we'll just run away he doesn't have to know he's in the country he'll come back later yeah. he he won't be able to find us but right as they're starting to do that bluebeard comes back and he he obviously knows that she went in this and found this 
this key. And so she says, he's, he says, okay, well, I have to kill you now. Like, you know, my secret. And she says, can I please have one last prayer with my sister and then you can kill us? And uh, cause they're French, they're very Catholic, yeah. very religious. And so they're, they're down on their knees to say this prayer. And right as Bluebeard is about to strike the final blow, all their brothers come in and kill Bluebeard and save the day. Huh. So, um, wow. dramatic, terrifying, very, dramatic, very terrifying, um, <laughs> a, an amazing story that we don't hear much. Yeah. Um, so I think we should bring back the two term blue bearding. Understand. Obviously there are <sighs> parallels between Bluebeard and Lyda. She <laughs> is just killing husbands yeah. left and right. Obviously she's not as brutal thankfully yeah. but that doesn't you know that's not any consolation to these the families of these men that she killed but it kind of does make sense as to why this kind of became her nickname now the lastly and then i'll let you speak because <laughs> you're probably tired of hearing me talk no no <laughs> um so there is some question this our our favorite book talks about how she is one of the first female serial killers mm. i i started to to do a little bit of research there are quite a few before her Belle Gunnis killed 14 people between 1884 and 1908. Jane Toppin was a nurse. She killed 30 plus people between 1895 and 1901. There's Amy Archer Gilligan. Um, she killed 60 plus people wow. um, in a very similar way to Lida. Uh -huh. She killed them for insurance money basically. And that was between 1910 and 1917. So all of these people are before Lida. And then there's the question, do you inc include women like Elizabeth Bathory, Delphine uh -huh. LaLaurie, Daria Salchikova, who was a Russian lady and so all of these women because i don't know if you know this so they are all they're all nobility and they're all accused of killing servants and oh. slaves so elizabeth bathory is like 14th century hungary uh, -huh. uh delphine lalori is in new orleans during the slave era daria salchikova is 18th century russian so during the reign of catherine the great okay. and so they have kind of become folk tales yeah so do we include them there are official transcripts of their crimes and things like that but but there's no not any confirmed numbers and because yeah. they're nobility they're mostly just exiled they're not necessarily ex i think elizabeth bathory is executed but i know delphine lalaurie just went to france she was oh, sent to exile yeah. in france and things like that and so do we include them in kind of that female serial killer label there's a list that i found a lot of these names on it was on ranker.com and they have a list of the most famous and notorious serial killers and lida is not on them yeah um yeah. and i don't know if that's because she just isn't well known outside of idaho if uh -huh. it's because her numbers comparatively were so low she only killed maybe five people maybe yeah. six people which is obviously not to say that's only only yeah, like yeah. one is too many right but so compared to yeah 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 so ones, 60 yeah. plus 30 plus yeah. you know no official count for some of these other ones i'd say the time frame that she operated in and kind of the mode of killing and especially in the united states she is one of the first mm -hmm. but i i wouldn't list her as the first okay but i think she would kind of have that distinction and that she did it poisoning by poisoning and again like i said she's not the first to do that but yeah. but that is a, a far more common for women because women don't have the brute strength that men do women aren't able to just stab people yeah, or yeah. choke people and um, she had she she was into the the insurance policy like mm -hmm. she had that motivation mm -hmm. for money right. where it sounds like some of these others were just just to, to do it just to like, do it yeah. right like yeah. jane toppin who was a nurse she said she, she just liked to watch it which yeah. i hate it's oh. very gross so yeah, that is that is Lida wow. and Lady Bluebeard and one of the the most infamous serial killers in Idaho history, I'd say. Absolutely. So wow, well, great research. Yeah. That was an extremely thorough and <laughs> well. Thank you. I, wow. I I love the ladies out here. So I yeah. you know I want to give them the. As we go through, mm -hmm. like, like their jobs, what mm -hmm. what do they list yeah. their occupation as? So I was reading uh, Lida when she comes in, she just lists her occupation as a housewife because mm -hmm. she's married, and um, you know it is the 1920s. Later, supposedly, when she marries, I think it's when she marries 
Whitlock in in Colorado, I think she lists her occupation as a nurse. It may be when she marries uh, Paul Southard. I can't remember. One of the the later husbands when she marries yeah. them, her occupation is listed as a nurse. Yeah. But as far as I can tell, she only graduated high school. She didn't get any secondary education. And again, it's kind of it's the late 19 teens, early 1920s that she's growing up in women. It's like the flabber era is only just beginning. Right. And so the idea of like liberated women and women, you know, doing things with their lives is not quite the same. Yeah. Um, yeah, So she may, she may have gotten training, but I don't know after she got married when she would have had time for Uh. that. So as far as I can tell, you know, you can list anything as your occupation. Absolutely. So as far as I can tell, she was just mostly qualified for housework. And um, I think she did a lot of sewing and and knitting and crocheting while she was in here. Nice. So, so she wasn't a chemist. She you was can't call not. What she did with fly paper chemistry. But she, okay. but she, uh, she was clearly smart enough to know there was arsenic on, yeah. on this. She understood this, that. Yeah, wow, yeah, that's so. amazing. Well, if you hear sounds in the background, we are recording live from the penitentiary while it's open. Yes. So, um, if you hear some stomping around or um, children screaming, we do apologize. If you have come to the old pen and come <laughs> to the J. Curtis Earl Weapons Museum, the World War One battle trench. Beneath that is where we are actually recording this show. Mm-hmm. So so people climb up on the, the trench and yes. they shoot the fake gun. And they go whole so hog you may, into it. Yeah, yeah, you may hear that yeah. as we go through. And then, of course, Lida Southard. Mm-hmm. What do you remember about Lida? She was a, a nice and congenial person. You know, she just was friendly and, and, and she seemed to take an interest in me, I guess, because... Um, I was one of the newer ones there, I guess. And uh, she was uh, always really kind to us all, you know, congenial with everybody. Never had any problem that I know of. Please like and follow our Facebook page, Old Idaho Penitentiary. From there, you can connect with us directly by joining the Behind Gray Walls podcast group, where you can find the mugshots of the inmates featured in today's episode, supplementary images of the penitentiary, and discussions between group members. We'd love to see you there. If you like the podcast, please consider making a donation. You can do that by going to store.history.idaho.gov slash donation.aspx. Be sure to click the Behind Gray Walls podcast tab on the left side of the page. Any donation amount is appreciated and will go toward improving the quality of this podcast, enabling us to bring you the stories that we love and that we hope you love too. All right, let's hear about Raymond. Talk about Ray Snowden. Yay. Yeah, so, I mean, not yay. Well, it's rough. Yeah, it's rough. Yeah, the whole story is tragic. Mm-hmm. Um, he was born in Middleborough, Massachusetts on October 22nd, 1921. And this this town he comes from is is uh, known for shoemaking and making fire engines. His dad was actually a shoemaker. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. And in 2012, interestingly enough, the town passed an ordinance outlawing profanity in public. Oh. So it's actually a $20 fine if you swear in public. Is this like a, is this like a Puritan stronghold? It's Massachusetts? It's, I mean, it, it's it, had to have been. I, it's from what, like sorry, the 1600s. Sorry, what city did you say? Uh, it's Middleborough, Massachusetts. And 1600s? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. all Puritans. So it's, it's a very historic What town. year did that get passed? That? 2012. What? Yeah. So oh, seven dear. years ago. I mean, this, it's just I thought, crazy. I thought that was like back when he was alive. And yeah, I was like, oh, I'm yeah. not surprised oh, by that. No, 2012. No. This, this happened, so you yeah. just can't, you can't be out in the street just saying whatever you want to say. Yes, no. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Middleborough. Is this Utah? Oh. Oh, sorry. Sorry. That, so, was, that was rough. Ray, when he arrives here, he's 35 years old. He has hazel eyes, brown hair. He's five foot seven. He's really thin. He's 135 pounds. They ask him about his vices, and he says yes to every one of them. He says he oh. drinks excessively, he smokes, he gambles, and he drugs. I mean, he, he drugs. He drugs, <laughs> yes. Uh, he had smoked a few marijuana cigarettes. He drugs. <laughs> uh, we have to say that now. He drugs. And he drugs. Yes. He drinks uh, and he drugs. <laughs> so. He is born the sixth of eight siblings. He has two older brothers, three older sisters, mm-hmm. and two younger brothers. Okay, interesting. So he's younger yeah, in the lineup, and is, Lida was older. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and he's uh, his mom, you know, says that he had a pleasant childhood, but mm-hmm. you know, he has scars on his back that are listed in his Bertillon record mm-hmm. uh, from beatings that he got from his 
his brother. So oh my on gosh. every inmate intake record, there's a naked little figurine, and they <laughs> they draw out any tattoos. He had a rose mm. tattoo on an arm, and okay. and another tattoo on his left arm, and you know these scars on his back. And he said those were from beatings from his older siblings oh who gosh. essentially raised him. His dad got sick with tuberculosis and was sent to a hospital. Oh, yeah. And then shortly after, his mom divorced his dad. So, okay. you know, he's basically getting raised by his older siblings. And, uh, you know, his mom described him as truthful, generous, very quick temper, a mm-hmm. good worker, nice personality, <laughs> lovable as a child. <laughs> he has a nice personality. Uh, yeah. And, <laughs> and we'll see that this, you know, is just... And she kind was the, the last best last thing that she yeah, okay yeah she has the biggest heart for this individual like as mother should right yeah because sometimes we get inmates and and often in real life you get mothers who who don't go to bat for their kids and that's just heartbreaking it is yeah yeah and and she she did which mm. is which is hard um yeah. starting at the age of twelve he was in trouble he went to this place called the Lyman School for Boys and that was by himself he he committed a, a B and E, he broke and entered this building and, mm-hmm. and started looting it and got caught. And then over the next, you know, six years he was in and out of this school for boys for vagrancy, for being drunk. He was arrested and investigated several times for different mm-hmm. crimes. So, you know, rough childhood. Mm-hmm. He said that, you know, when he was at school he could keep a B average. He was a good student, mm-hmm. but he didn't think his teachers liked him. And uh, they kind of preferred that he, when he was at the principal's office. So mm. um, he didn't spend a lot of time. He went through his first year of high school and okay. then dropped out in okay. uh, ninth grade. So after he drops out, he joins the Civilian Conservation Corps mm-hmm. in January 1940. Okay. CCC. And, yeah, exactly. It's popular. They use that a lot in Idaho. Yeah, yeah. And so he was actually put on duty. There was a big hurricane that okay. went across the East Coast. And so he oh. was sent out to the, the mm-hmm. forested areas to help mm-hmm. clean up the mess and now, for yeah. those who don't know, the CCC, the Civilian, Civilian Conservation Corps, is part of the New Deal enacted by Roosevelt to try to pull the country out of the Depression. Yeah. Um, and actually, but it actually, that was one of the ones that stuck around. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, don't isn't it, doesn't it still exist, the CCC today? I think some, some aspects yeah. of it, for so, sure. Yeah, so. Um, it was huge. So, 1940, like, so it yeah. still would have been in place. And so, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. After serving about a year with the CCC, he actually joins a traveling carnival. <gasps> And then oh. can only spend a, a couple months as a as a carny, and then he returns to the CCC, and then decides to join the military, and that's okay. when he goes down to Florida, and he he enlists on March twenty fourth, nineteen forty one. So World War Two is is happening yep. in Europe right now. What um, what does he join? Just the, the army? Yeah. Okay. Just the United States Army. Okay. Yeah. And at at one point during his training, he asks to leave the base, but his first sergeant refuses it. And so he leaves anyway. Oh, um, the sergeant don't do that. says he's, you know, court-martialed him for AWOL. He's arrested, brought back to the camp. And while he's locked in the guardhouse, he actually assaults his guard, breaks the man's jaw, and escapes for two days. He's recaptured do at his either. house. They find him at his house and bring him back. <laughs> and he's dishonorably discharged from the So office. he ran, but he just ran to his house. That's like the first yeah, place they'll yeah. look, and literally. We, yeah, right? I mean, we, his, this story happens so uh, many times. So his house in Florida? Uh, this, or in back I, in Massachusetts? In, in Florida, yeah. So he did he move there with any family? Was he just there by himself? Was like an apartment himself. sort of thing? Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, they didn't, there wasn't a lot of detail into where it was. Gotcha. They just said that they found him at his house, so wherever that was. And so he's actually dishonorably discharged from the army on November 14th, 1942, and sentenced to a year at the Camp Landing Stockade in Florida. So he okay. s- spends a year in military prison. Okay. He's released, and, you know, we th- I think he went up to New York, and that's where he meets his first wife, who's the 17-year-old girl, uh, the 17-year-old woman. But uh, She's still a girl. Yeah. Right. She's 17. Right. Yeah. So they get into several arguments. She actually divorces him. Um, she actually had a baby while they were together. Aww. But he refuses paternity. <gasps> so he said it, he didn't think it was his. Gross. Yeah. So there could be some of, you know, raised children Snowden out in the be world. Snowden could be out there. Yeah. So after this, he moves to Nebraska. He meets this woman. And they the only thing he could remember was marrying her. Sometime, he thinks in 1950 in Arizona, it was an extremely rainy day. That's all he could say about this marriage. About a year after they got married, they got into a huge fight in Los Angeles. He ended up beating her. He was arrested Ugh. and put in jail. When he was released, she said, nope, we're done. Good. And so he Good left. Yeah. 
And then he meets his last girlfriend, whose name is Marcel Cobb. And Marcel, he and Marcel moved to Portland uh, in Oregon and then moved to Boise and they live in a hotel in downtown Boise in the Milner. Okay. And uh, September 10th, 1956, Ray snaps. He beats her up. Ugh. He breaks a couple of her ribs, knocks out a tooth or two and Ugh. blackens her eye. So what was this argument over? Does it say? It doesn't say. Uh, uh, she, I think it was due to his drinking. Uh, but yeah. So Yikes. So she, sorry, broke ribs. Yeah, broke ribs. Knocked, knocked out teeth. teeth. Yeah, it's one to two teeth. Blackened her eye. Blackened her oh eye. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Ugh. And she doesn't press charges. No. She you actually. Do that. He Ugh. he spends the night in jail and okay. then is released back into her custody. She doesn't press charges, and they're together for a few days, and then she decides to end it. She actually goes off with another man. Now tell me if I'm wrong, because. We've talked about this before. So there is a threat that he makes. Is it against her or is it against the woman that he attacks so, later? Yes. Yeah, so this is this threat was towards her. He towards said her. that he was during this attack that he was gonna sever her spinal column. Ugh. Yes. That's, which is uh, too much I like detail. cannot I the, the thought of the brute strength that that would take right. to sever one's spinal cord, oh. because you have to push all the way, this is so gross, you have to push all the way through the throat. Mm -hmm. And not only that, you have to be strong enough to sever that spinal cord. That's bone, yeah. That's, like, yes, what? Yes. What? So this will later, <sighs> yes, be part of the investigation. So after she leaves, like, you know, he, he's working in this little warehouse downtown Boise. And, you know, he is, he was a basically a nomad too through the 1950s and, mm -hmm. and the 40s, mm -hmm. just kind of like Lida, just kind of jumping from one relationship mm -hmm. to the other and finding different jobs. Well, now he needs to find Marcel. He wants her back. And he gets word on, uh, on September 22nd, 1956 that she's back in town. Mm -hmm. And she, he, thought that she had gone to Colorado with an ex-husband of hers oh. and uh, was coming back into town. So he goes to all these different so, clubs. So he was coming back into town from Colorado? Uh, uh, he was still Supposed in town. Oh, she okay. was. She, yeah, Marcel. Okay. Okay. Marcel, who gotcha. he had just beaten and all this yep. stuff. And broken up. And yeah, Okay, so now yeah. she's coming back. So he's okay. going to all these clubs in Garden City. He's going to the Pink Elephant, the Alpine Club, the Lone Pine Club, and finally ends up at the High Hope Looking Club, for her. Looking for her. Okay. And he's been drinking all day long. Mm. Finally, he scouts the room and he doesn't see Marcel. But he does see another woman. Her name's Cora Lucille Dean. She's about 12 years older than Ray. He's, he's like 34, 35 at this point. They hit it off. He taps her on the shoulder and, and she asks him to dance. Oh. And they're seen dancing together, having a couple drinks together. Mm -hmm. It's about nine, nine at night on this night. And uh, finally... Ray says, you know, I got to I got to go. So he walks outside and she follows him out. And basically they have a discussion. And this is there's some con contention between, you know, did he say that, you know, with a rape or death, you choose uh -huh. that there are a lot of sensationalized yeah. stories that say that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the official report said that he was actually crossing the street to a there's this little place, there's this little paint store mm -hmm. um, and there was a little uh, phone out there and he was going oh. to to call okay. and she followed him out and then oh. some sort of conversation ensued between the two and uh the official report says that basically she was asking him for a ride to downtown boise mm -hmm. and he was like you know i'm not some gentleman i'm gonna pay for your taxi fare back to boise which again i just think is very funny that as a human you normally want to be considered like the nice person right. like yeah. usually the facade that you put on is like yeah sure i'll pay for your taxi because mm -hmm. i'm a good guy but like he yeah. genuinely was like i will not i am not a gentleman yeah. which is wild to me that's yeah. crazy and and interestingly they both went out that night angry and upset because she she had been drinking early in the day and uh -huh. was supposed to have a nice lunch with with her, her with her boyfriend and he got upset at her oh, yeah. and threw a five dollar bill at her and said this is your taxi fare home tonight and you but know, then she spent it all on drinks so exactly. she didn't have any fare exactly. to get home okay yeah and so and then Ray is looking for Marcel and so it gets heated and uh, Ray says that she kicks him in the groin mm -hmm. and as he's doubled over he raises up he throws her onto the ground oh, no. and cuts her throat Oof. he realizes Yikes. that the first cut isn't enough oh, uh, he said that no. uh, she was moaning and groaning so I wanted to stop the noise so I cut her throat again he plunged the knife into the back of her neck Ugh. severing the spinal cord 
Uh, okay, so he pushes her down on her back, yeah. slices her throat. Is she dead at he, this point? He cuts the front of her throat because right. he severs a, a, an artery and cuts her voice so box, but she's still alive. She's still and alive, she's and he flips yeah. her over yeah. and severs her spinal cord, which yes. you have to be dead at that point. Right. That has to kill that, her. That, was that, the, that, that was kills the her. That kills her. Yes. Ugh. But it doesn't end there. So he ends up Ugh. dragging her body around the side of this paint store, kind of kind of a hidden away. The only lights, there's a neon light on this paint store, and then there's the uh, traffic sign on 38th and Shinden. So those are the only lights, but nobody saw this and, happen. Yeah, I was going to say, because Shinden is a major street. Right. I drive yeah. down the street every like day to get yeah. to work. Exactly. That's, this is not a, there's businesses everywhere. Mm -hmm. If there's clubs everywhere, I would imagine people, people are out. Taxis And no one everywhere. is seeing this. Exactly, nobody I don't, sees this. I don't understand. Yeah, so he drags her body around, cuts her her clothing <gasps> off, oh. and then continues to mutilate her. He, uh, well, let me get to the coroner's report. So Ugh. this part, it's it's upsettingly graphic. I'm not okay. gonna lie. All um, right. So, so if, if you, you are have, squeamish, yes, pause this for like at or least like the next go forward minute or two. Okay. Yes, or yes. skip ahead. Skip ahead. Yeah. Use your um, little thirty second skip button. Yeah. So this is from the coroner. He told the court that there was a cut below into the center of the right eye. A cut through the front of her throat that severed her voice box and jugular vein. Stab wounds on her left eyelid, leaving a gaping <gasps> left eye. What? Her left breast was nearly entirely sawed no, away. No, no. Several stabs to the abdomen. Her right nipple had been skinned away. Uh. And, and this, this part of the investigation, they would later ask Raymond, you know, what happened to her right nipple? He cannibalized it. He ate uh. it. <clears throat> uh. Several cuts to her sides and thighs and her groin. The most severe cut was into the back of her neck, which uh, hit bone. Beeman stated that towards oh. the top of her head was a one and a half inch cutting wound, which slid under the base of her skull and cut the woman's spinal cord and is the wound which actually caused death. I, again, the, the idea of how much like anger right. you would have to have, because yeah. first of all, stabbing is always a much more personal um, way to kill someone because you have to like look them in the face. Right, yeah. Um, Oh. So the like the rage he must have had toward this woman for like a very small reason. Yeah. But again, just the anger and the force that it would take to cut through bone yeah. and sever your spinal cord is it's horrific. So horrific. Scary that yeah they they the blood splatter report I oh, unfortunately read that <laughs> and there was blood seventy two inches like what you know that's like six feet up six in the air up feet. on the side of this paint store yeah oh um, my so, gosh i mean this this was a sadistic brutal killing and and after he did all this he got up he lit a cigarette and he smoked it standing over the body he walked out to the street and put his thumb out trying <sighs> to get a ride and just a c civilian from boise actually pulled over gave him a ride and and the civilian saw blood i was gonna on say is pants, he covered in blood and on his palms six yes. feet up and on the paints where he yeah, has to be covered. But right. sorry, it's just on his pants and his hands. That's that's what that's what the civilian, that's what the guy saw. And and he asked him, you know, what happened? And and Ray told him, Oh, I got into a fight tonight, I had a bloody nose. And so mm -hmm. the guy drops him off and uh Ray goes to this this bowling alley where his buddies frequent and he uh, one of the the staff members is a buddy of his asks him for his pair of pants he goes into the into the bathroom cleans himself off changes his clothes then he walks out and he uh, returns to his his home goes to bed that night so and so there is a rumor that it happened at, he changed at Hannafin's yeah and is I that, did not find okay any evidence so of it's that, a bit of a rumor he did so the next morning he he balled up his clothes and uh -huh. he disposed of those uh -huh. he, he did toss his knife into the gutter outside of Hannafin's okay so that that is true that okay. is the connection because I know that on ghost adventures they go in they, they go into Hannafin's and say like is his ghost here and like the right. people at Hannafin's like yes, yes but he like wasn't even in there yes okay well, don't listen to ghost adventures Paranormal investigations, paranormal things sell. That is that is true. That we, we do make a lot, lot of money about. on those. Yes. So the next morning, Ray goes fishing. Mm -hmm. And yep, as a normal person does. Yeah. After you've brutally murdered someone, fishing right. sounds nice. Yeah. And about seven thirty a.m., this thirteen-year-old boy is riding his bike, hunting for beer bottles, and he sees this thing that he thought was a mannequin laying oh, on the side. No. So he goes over and and it. It scared him. He ran out to the street. He was waving his arm. He was actually 
riding his bike towards the police station and he saw an officer and he started waving his oh. arms and this officer as his, his name was uh, Fred Walker pulled over and asked you know what's wrong to this little 13 year old boy who's sobbing oh. and all he hears is body through the sobbing so oh, he calls dispatch baby. and he goes around to the crime scene he said it was the worst thing he had, had ever oh, come across oh my gosh and that poor 13 year old yeah. I just want to say so many prayers for his little right. like his little soul and didn't you say that he's still alive he's still and like alive living in Idaho living Oh yeah. So oh. if if you were listening, like I'm sorry, I'm so if sorry. you have to hear this yes. and, and like, relive this, I trauma. Oh, I that mean, poor... goes always for these things. Uh, I am so uh, sad for him. Yeah. I can't. I can't even imagine. Yeah. And I'm much older than 13. Like right, that yeah. is. I can't. Oh, the trauma of that. I can't even imagine. And, yeah. And the the officer that came across it, he he had just been working all night. His shift started at midnight, so he's oh. you know right at the end of his shift. Here's this huge thing that he has to now handle, and so he calls the deputy sheriff Willie Schreidler, who comes and Schreidler actually brings his camera and, and takes the crime scene photos. Mm -hmm. And the defense would later say like. No, this, first off, this guy is not a photographer. He's a sheriff. And second off, this is inflammatory and will create prejudice in the minds of any who view these photos. So constantly throughout the, the hearing that we'll get to, mm. they're saying, no, you can't use these photos. Mm, like they speak not, for themselves. It's not this official. Is, and, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So basically they start to try to find out it actually takes them a while to figure out who this woman is because of what he oh had done to gosh. her face. And once they Oof. find that out, they start to question everybody in the surrounding bars. Mm -hmm. and they go to the high ho, and mm -hmm. they, they when they find out that it's Cora, they ask who was she with last, and that's when they get kind of an idea of who this was. Mm -hmm. the The man who picked Ray up immediately called investigators yeah. when the story broke and uh -huh. said, "You know what? I gave a guy a ride last night, covered in blood." I dropped him off here. And so the, the police are starting to look. They get the autopsy report back and find out that her spinal column had been completely severed. Mm -hmm. So when they get that, they start to go, huh, this is all sounding like that Ray Snowden. Right. Because the girlfriend, even though she didn't press charges, she did tell them. Yes. He, yeah, they did have he said this to me. Yeah. Yeah. And so within two days, they they finally arrest Ray at his apartment. He admits to it. He actually signs two confessions. It takes a while to get him to admit mm -hmm. to it, but mm -hmm. he signs two confessions. The first time he, he arrives at the court, he pleads not guilty, which is like... Okay. okay. So he I mean, still wants try. to fight. Yeah. I think there's lots of evidence against you, buddy, so you might yes. want to rethink that. Yeah. He's actually condemned initially. Uh, he actually plead, he changes his plea to guilty. He's condemned to hang on December 7th, 1956. He appeals this. The court, actually, the judge, you know, at the appeal says uh, the court had no other alternative than to find the defendant guilty of willful, deliberate and premeditated killing in view of the defendant's acts of deliberately opening up a pocket knife and then hacking and cutting until he had killed Cora Lucille Dean. This case exemplifies an abandoned and malignant heart and sadistic mind mm -hmm. bent on taking human life. The imposition of the death sentence was not an abuse of discretion, and his date was set for October 18th, 1957. So basically what that's saying is, is because first degree murder, you always have to, it has to be premeditated. Exactly. So what they're saying is just by opening that pocket knife, that is considered that premeditation. That was the act of premeditation, exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So he's, he's brought here to the prison. He would spend 13 months at this site. He would actually be hung five days before his birthday. Uh -huh. um, so he would have been 37. But while he's here, you know, he's got all these siblings. He has a sister that writes him and mm -hmm. basically tells him to like, hey, you should read the Bible. And mm -hmm. luckily he has one visitor that comes regularly. And this is the chaplain, you know, okay. somebody who's, ha who's hired and paid to come mm -hmm. and read the Bible with him. And the chaplain, we actually have some oral histories with the chaplain. Uh, so I'll play some of that for you mm -hmm. in a moment. But mm -hmm. uh, he said that, you know, Ray was, was exceptionally intelligent when he put his mind to something. He mm -hmm. would memorize whole passages of the Bible mm -hmm. and he would come and, and just be blown away that Ray could recite these passages. Wow. And he would also do crossword puzzles. And uh, when he ran out of crossword puzzles that his sister would send to him, mm -hmm. he would actually make his own. And, and I, I went through some of these ones that are in his, in his inmate file. And some of the words that pop out to me are outcast, remote, underrate 
outrage, mistakes, rancid, hmm. tombs, terror, frantic. You know, these oh, yeah. words that are kind of prominent, mm -hmm. prominently written mm -hmm. onto these crosswords. And, mm -hmm. you know, I can only imagine what he's going through in his mind. I was there for Rain and Snow. And that's the last one in the state. It was 1957, I think. And uh, I got to know Raymond real well. He had committed a very horrible murder on a woman down in Garden City. And I won't describe it for you because it's, papers didn't even put all that in there. But it was terrible. And for a year, he, he, he appealed the case. Got his attorney to appeal it to the Supreme Court. And uh, for a year, I would go down to visit him regularly. He was a crossword puzzle fan. And I mean, he was good. Never even had a dictionary. He said, I'd take a fence on him. Go across like that, go around like that, and go across like that. Me, I'd take 10 hours to do what he'd do in 15, 20 minutes, you know. Hey, I got studying the Bible. Asked me, like to do it. He had never been in church, but he said, yeah. And he just did it, I know, for something to do. But then the Supreme Court finally turned him down. They set a date for the district court. Do, like, do we know how he felt? Like, as he's sitting in this cell, like, is there any sort of record that we have where he said, like, did he talk to the chaplain and say, like, I'm really sorry about this. I know that I shouldn't have done it. Is the Bible changing his mind, quote unquote? Yeah. So actually, the chaplain sits down to it with him and asks, you know, Ray, do you think the crime you committed so bad, even God couldn't forgive you? You know, the ultimate forgiver. Mm -hmm. he, you think you're so bad that even he couldn't forgive you? Ray said, yeah. He thought uh -huh. that even God couldn't forgive him for what he had done. I went down that night and I said, uh, Ray, do you think you committed too terrible a crime for God to forgive? And for the first time he looked me in the eye and he said, yes. And I read him a scripture that said, God will forgive anything. I said, do you think about that tonight? And I went out and prayed with him the next morning. And he was sentenced to die 30 days later. He was the most peaceful man. In the execution chamber. Some of the guards have been drinking to get the courage up. The warden was naturally white faced because he had to give the order. And, uh, he, uh, on his intake form, he admitted to stabbing two other women. And the FBI oh. came and interviewed him several times about two cold cases, one in New York and one in Colorado, that had very similar cuts there and similar young women uh -huh. that, that he could have possibly brutally uh, killed. And actually, I'll, I'll play this audio clip from an oral uh -huh. history from the deputy warden mm -hmm. who gave Ray this exam. And asked him all these different questions about his life and his things that he was interested in. And... Ray told the FBI he had never been to Colorado, mm -hmm. but when he's talking to the deputy warden taking this exam, he says that, yeah, he loved to ride his motorcycle through Colorado, especially this uh -oh. hill where this, this oh, cold case. Oh, no way. Yeah. <gasps> so, I mean, this is Ooh. all speculation, and I don't want to get too far into that. But I had uh, administered the Minnesota Multiphasic, and I had, had some special instruction in it, in the, uh, it would be impossible for us to get a, somebody to come here and give it to him, but that I would be glad to give it, uh, Snowden, the Minnesota Multiphasic, and, and let him have the results of it. So we worked it out that way. So that, that gave me an excuse to see Snowden. Are you familiar with the Minnesota Multiphasic? No. It's 500 questions, and it's a pretty tedious uh, deal. It takes quite a little time to give it. I think I probably gave it to him maybe over three sessions. And, but I, I probably spent more time on it than I would have under ordinary circumstances. There are a lot of things that maybe you'd have got a question yes or no on or something like this. But uh, uh, I was given, I gave Snowden a, a good chance to be verbal on it. And, and uh, he, uh, I think, enjoyed it because it gave him something to do and uh, somebody to talk to and somebody to visit with, which he was spending a lot of time down in his cell by himself. So, but I gave him this test, uh, which is 500 questions. And uh, out of the test, I, I got some information that probably other people had never been able to get out of it by accident. For instance, I'm convinced there was a co-ed killed in Colorado 
about a year and a half or two years before we had Snowden here. And the FBI and other sources had questioned Snowden about the death of that girl, and he had denied that he had ever been in Colorado. And in, this, in giving this uh, Minnesota multiphasic or something that came up, I don't know whether it uh, said something directly about motorcycles or whether it just um, something about recreation, what he, what he liked to do most or something like that in uh, sports activity. And he, he got into riding motorcycles. And uh, I said, where'd you ever ride a motorcycle? He said, I rode to Pikes Peak once. Well, he told the FBI off and on for six months that he'd never been in Colorado. So I got him to talk a little bit about that and went back the next day and he still talked a little bit about it. So I was convinced that he was in Colorado and I was convinced that he probably murdered the girl. He talked a lot about his father too, about his treatment and uh, his feelings towards his father. But anyway, I spent... Did he talk about the murder that he no, committed? No, no, he wouldn't talk about it. Um, but, uh, and I never tried to get him to talk about it. One thing, I had to be careful because here, you know, I'm doing this and there's still a chance he might come on the Board of Pardons and I'm on the Board of Pardons, you know, and I didn't want to know anything about the murder or any of that. But anyway, I got pretty well acquainted with him and I think, he uh, uh, kind of liked me, and uh, he uh, requested once or twice that I come down to see him. So he admitted to stabbing two other women. Uh-huh. He didn't say where or who no, they were. No, he never. But there he are never two, speak any more than that. two stabbings, one in New York and one in Colorado, who yeah. match. Yeah. Very similar mos and and things like that. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. So the death warrant is read to him at 11.28 p.m., October 17th, 1957. Uh, he's condemned by the state of Idaho to hang by the neck till he's dead for the crime of murder in the first decree. Mm-hmm. The warden then asks him, Ray, do you have any last words? And, you know, there's some speculation. Mm-hmm. The official report says that he said, I do. I just don't know how to say them. Mm. There were witnesses that were invited. There were 12 and eight of them were police officers. There was a county prosecutor and then a couple prison staff Mm -hmm. who were in the witness room. And then there were journalists invited, but none of them wanted to be in the witness Mm -hmm. room. During the day, Ray got to hear as the executioner tested out this trap door Mm -hmm. and how it would slam Mm -hmm and rattle the floor. Mm -hmm. What was in the window? We have heard many times that that was like a one-way glass and all kinds of things. Can you describe that? We had glass in there. We didn't have glass in when uh, Snowden was executed. But we had glass, and we put glass in the second time. I think there was only glass put in there twice. And the second time, maybe they tried to put a plastic deal. But the what would you say, percussion from the door going down broke the glass up uh, on any time we tried it. Oh, just in a test. In a test. Uh, so when Snowden was executed, there the was wire. nothing there? Just a wire there. A wire? A wire. Put a wire up there. Like a? a chicken wire. Oh, that would cover the whole space. Yeah, it just covered the whole space. Yeah. So then he faced the witnesses. Be- no. no, he faced away from them. Oh, so they never saw his face before the hood went on or anything? Just all they could see was when he came into the room, they could see him. Because they were over here and he came in that door and brought him about into here, so they could have, they could have seen him, uh, his face or at that time. But when, he, when, they, when they put him down, I don't know who carried him. I suppose a couple of the guards did. I know the chaplain and I were right behind him. Uh, mm. When he was given his final meal, uh, which was lobster, sweet potatoes, asparagus, a toss salad, cranberry sauce, hot rolls, tea, and strawberry shortcake. Cranberry sauce with lobster? Also, yeah. how good was that lobster, do you think? <laughs> In Idaho? No, uh, not good. I, I'm I would telling imagine you, we not do good. have the most inland sea for it. I know that United you States. say that, but it is up north, a good eight hours from <laughs> here. Eight <laughs> so. Hour. <laughs> It's sure it might be fresh yeah. when it comes out of the river in Coeur d'Alene, <laughs> but it's got to make its way down here. Yes. Yeah, so apparently 
he could not finish this meal. He only actually took a few uh, listen, few bites. Listen, left and right. <laughs> you eat that whole meal. It is your last one. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, he I eat every spent, meal like it's yeah. my last meal. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so he he basically spent his evening sipping tea and hearing this trap door slamming uh, all day long as they're testing it yes. out and they're stretching out the rope. Uh-huh. The prison administrator said the whole prison was eerily quiet that mm. whole day all the con- all the men that are in you know they're not condemned to hang but they're hearing this mm-hmm. trapdoor go right. off and they're feeling the emotion that wow this could have been me and know? this is the first execution in about 20 years uh, when no, was in, when in was Walrath and Powell that in was 6 1951. years okay. yeah. um, okay. so but they were hung outside the prison walls away from the rest of the prison population and it wasn't it was at a temporary gallows exactly, so they yeah. didn't have to test it in the same way yeah, right because yeah. this is the first time that the trapdoor is being used in five house the new mm-hmm. maximum security building exactly. so that building is only About what three years yeah. old at this point yeah Okay, so years, it's the first yeah. time this is ever being used. So Walrath and Powell may not have had the same effect necessarily exactly. on the prison as yeah. the entire prison hearing that that open and be slammed shut and yeah. open and be slammed shut. Okay. Yeah, so after all the death rites, everything is, is given to, to Ray. He's led into the execution chamber at 12.05 a.m. No, sorry. He is strapped to something, right? Yes. Yeah, they strap him to this this gurney. It's like uh, a bodyboard sort of thing. Exactly, okay. yeah. And they strap his, his ankles to it. They belt up his, his knees and thighs to it and his, his arms to it. And uh, when he's brought onto the, the spot, mm-hmm. they, they put a hood over his face mm-hmm. and then they put the rope around his neck. Right. So why did they do, why did they put him on that gurney thing? So that, it was, it was extra weight mm-hmm. for one. And then it was to prevent him from trying to run. And if he fainted or anything else like that, it would, it would keep him straight. Erect. Okay. They had a uh, board that look, would look like an ironing board. It hinged in the middle. So you could fold it down and put it in the car. And when you put it up and it latched some way, so it was a stiff board, and um, it was uh, all five or five and a half feet high. And on the bottom right down here was a, a little uh, ledge that stuck out about that far, about that wide. As we kind of discussed, once he hit the end of that rope, his head would yeah, that's gonna, slam back yeah, into that's this. Yeah, that's going to, because that's kind of the whole thing is you have to yeah. get enough force. And this is very gross and graphic, but you have to get enough. The gravity as it's pulling you down, you have to have that force to literally pull your neck back and mm-hmm. break it, right? That's yeah. That's why hangings are theoretically so effective is yeah. because it snaps your neck and that's what kills you, right? Exactly. So you put him on a bodyboard that's not going to allow his neck to snap back the way that it's supposed to. Yeah. Ugh. So he drops at about 12, 12.05 a.m. and 45 seconds. Two doctors are downstairs that take his pulse and they uh, officially say that he died at 12.20, that it lasted 15 mm. minutes. Um, you'll hear from this little oral history clip from the chaplain talking about, you know, he, he died instantly, uh, but his heart just kept beating, which is pretty mm. common. But uh, there are mm. other other stories that we've heard from former, from former guards that he struggled and he, oh. he, yeah. And he's strapped to a gurney. Oh. They made a kind of a cradle to strap him into because we were hanging there. And if he fainted, he would choke to death. It would be a horrible thing. Where execution by hanging is actually the most merciful because the minute that uh, cord is broken in the back of your neck, but there's no feeling whatsoever. All intents and purposes, it, it, you know, your heart may be for 10 or 15 minutes, but you're dead. Yeah. Oh my gosh. We I, actually have the hood in our collection here at the Say It's Rose. I didn't know that. There is skin no. from the rope up against his throat. Oh. Yeah. I the first time I, I saw it, 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 it made me wheezy. I, I had to leave. Who okay. Right. I have so many questions. Why? I think is the main one. Why did we keep that? It was it was donated after we became a historic site. Uh who Captain had it? Captain Munch. No. I, I believe that's who donated Captain it. Captain Munch. Yeah. And Ugh. we also have the ropes to both Walrath and Powell, who, as we discussed, were executed six years previously. Mm. So I did not know that. Yeah. Oof. 
So, you know, he's got all of this family. His his mother's still alive. His siblings are all still alive. They ask, you know, do you want the body? His his brother Herbert writes back, you know, relatives or myself do not intend to claim the body. And so he is buried in the prison cemetery the next day. He has a, a tiny little little funeral, uh, chaplain styles, recites his his final message and they lower him to the ground and he is in an unmarked grave so his family didn't send money for a headstone either they did not okay. there is some mention in the statesman that there would be a headstone and you know there could have been one and maybe mm -hmm. it got stolen mm -hmm. at some point oh. but currently where we think he's buried it just simply says unknown okay yeah and that is Oof. ray's tragic and and horrific story yeah. i mean both of them, they, they both traveled a lot. Mm -hmm. They were never, they were kind of nomadic. Yeah. I mean, I do, yeah. I am interested in the fundamental, because I think there are very fundamental differences. Oh, I think absolutely. Yeah. Snowden was so much more reactionary. Mm -hmm. He um, had a temper, yeah. Yes. Um, whereas, as far as I can tell, everyone really liked Lyda. Mm -hmm. um, she was um, far less temperamental, and she... When she wasn't killing her husbands, she seemed to be a very like congenial, like lovely person. Yeah. And so hers seems a lot more psychopathic. I mean, in the fact that she is a serial killer, whereas Snowden, he may have been a serial killer, mm -hmm. but as far as we know for certain, he only killed this one. And so there are, I, don't, I, I mean, they seem bad in very different ways. Yeah. But they did yeah. the same thing. Uh -huh. But because his was more brutal, it almost seems worse. But she killed more, which seems worse. So like, yeah, they are they're fundamentally different, but both so bad. Right. It, it is very interesting to see this. I feel like to see the dichotomy between the two, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, man. Yeah. And I, I think it's good to clear up that the the Jack the Ripper thing that did not mm -hmm. come out in you know fifty six fifty seven when this crime occurred. This happened you know ten years later when this serial came out and mm. basically created. So he also this... had a serial written about him. Exactly, okay. yeah, about this crime. Mm -hmm. And you know these detective stories have have always been huge. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's that's where we get the the namesake of Jack the Ripper of mm -hmm. Idaho, mm -hmm. uh, which you know Cora was not a sex worker. She was mm -hmm. not into that so so we don't want to malign her by mm -hmm. calling him that and mm -hmm. but how he did it and what he did to mm -hmm. her you know was similar to right. to what jack the ripper right actually did. well and i just think about because like we love to have something to compare people exactly. to which is why i think they gave both of these people nicknames mm -hmm. to try to compare them because like jack the ripper he did it really brutally. And so I think that's what the newspaper people were trying to invoke was the just absolute brutality yeah. um, and how really like terrifying that concept is. Yeah. And and then whereas with you, when you use Bluebeard, it's less vicious and more just like a constant. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so they are effective because they do somewhat, I mean, his, I feel like, is a lot more of a stretch than maybe Lida's is. Yeah. But but they do kind of invoke this emotion and this idea behind the uh, originator, really, of those nicknames. Yeah. So it is interesting. I do think Idaho's Jack the Ripper is a little bit more intense. Mm -hmm. um, but, oh, man, newspaper. I mean, it was newspaper, a huge story. I was going to say, yeah. newspaper men love to sensationalize Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely, yeah. I'm just happy <laughs> that uh, he was captured soon after and and mm -hmm. it didn't happen again yeah. like if if this was the first time he had done this to somebody you know i the judge everybody was like you know this this could happen again this mm -hmm. guy seems to have some sort of detachment from reality mm -hmm. like yeah and and while he was being interviewed the uh it was super interesting going through his file mm -hmm. and and they were you know he was so open about everything in his life and he seemed to boast about the hard times and troubles that he had as a child Ah, fellow, but he'll be the last individual executed at mm -hmm. this site. Now, I've read that right after his execution, it caused this big debate in Boise as to the morality of the death penalty, whether he deserved to hang and strangle like that. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, we're not going to sit here and talk about our opinions on it. But I do 
it, I do think it's interesting that in, in 57, this brought up this huge debate. Right. Yeah. And it was a big debate around the country, I think. Mm -hmm. um, because when was it in the, was it in the 80s that it was, the sentence was commuted across the nation? Yeah, the moratorium started. And then, yeah. That was like through the 70s. Through the yeah. 70s. And then it was revoked in the 80s or 90s. Mm. And so Idaho still does have the death penalty. Yeah. Uh, it's now lethal injection rather than hanging. But And there have been, I, I don't want to say only three, but mm -hmm. there have only been three other executions mm -hmm. since Ray. Right. All by lethal injection. Yeah. And, you know, this is, I think, an issue that's never going to go away. Yeah, because I think as long as the death penalty exists, you will always have people who think that he deserved mm -hmm. to die, not just as a result of what he did, but to die so brutally. Um, but then you're going to have people who say like, even if he had been put to death, he it, no human ever deserves to go through that. Right. And yeah, I, I think, you know, this is a perfect example of, of that, that debate. It's yeah. It, it's so interesting. I don't yeah. know. I'm, I don't know well, what else to say. Well, Scott, I, I'm a little, I'm, a little speechless. After I'm excited that to not read anything more about <laughs> Ray for just a while. I, yeah. I, it's yeah. going to be a it's nice rough. break to yeah. not go through that mm -hmm. corner report mm -hmm. anymore. Um, yeah. So I think with that. Yeah. Sorry that it was so rough today. Hopefully this is the roughest that we get. Yes. Most of what we had in here were forgeries and mm -hmm. burglaries and, you know, grand larcenies. Which, yeah. which are going to be great stories yes. as well. Yeah. This is probably the, the most mm -hmm. graphic we mm -hmm. will get. So I think with that, yeah. Sky, uh, do your own time. Do your own number. If you enjoyed Behind Gray Walls, please rate, review, and subscribe so others can find our podcast. If you're interested in more Old Idaho Penitentiary information and to see mugshots of the inmates featured in this episode, follow the Old Idaho Penitentiary on Instagram and Facebook. If you want to learn more about the Idaho State Historical Society and its other sites, follow ID State Historical Society on Instagram or visit history.idaho.gov. If you have a question or comment for the hosts, please email us at behindgraywalls at gmail.com. I don't know, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a good deterrent and maybe something for inmates to see. You take in Idaho, uh, we probably had four to five hundred inmates here when Snowden was executed, and we probably had two to three hundred here when Wallace and Powell was executed. So all the rest of the, ex all the, rest of the inmates that went through the institution, they never, they never saw an execution. But I, I'll, bet that, I'll bet you that those inmates that were here in the institution during an execution, it had an impression on them that uh, maybe uh, still with them and to some extent. Maybe they don't think about it anymore, but it, it had a, it had an, uh, an impression on them, I'm sure.